I have to keep more in mind than uh, here and now because uh, because uh, things that I've already done are going to affect my kid as she's growing up. You know, even when I'm not around anymore, she's the you know all I. I I'm just debating whether or not I want how much I want attached to my name. And that's not a... I realize that uh, to a certain extent it's beyond my control, but um, for right now it's still within my control. And, uh, and if we can continue to work together, you know, then, and I think that there's some possibility that... Uh, keep the sensationalism of it all to a minimum, then uh, I don't have a problem with closing some cases. Israel Keys would often rent cars when he traveled and then drive thousands of miles to locations where he wanted to kill. In March of 2012, he was driving a rented Ford Focus when Texas officers pulled him over for just going two miles over the posted speed limit. After searching the vehicle, they found an ID, a debit card, and cell phone that all belonged to Samantha Koenig. Israel Keys was arrested. Israel was questioned at the FBI's field office in Anchorage, Alaska after he was extradited. Israel confessed to murdering Samantha Koenig to members of the Anchorage Police Department, the U.S. Attorney's Office, as well as numerous FBI agents. But before he would say more, Israel began what would become a pattern for giving information. He wanted an Americano coffee from Starbucks. He wanted a Snickers bar, and he wanted a particular brand of cigar which pisses me off personally because I feel he was just being a complete and utter dick at that point. I'm not sure if any of the FBI even considered the fact that an Americano is the exact cup of coffee that Israel ordered from Samantha Koenig the night that he kidnapped and killed her. So it just seemed like a huge game and it annoys the fuck out of me. But ultimately, Israel laid out the entire story of how the abduction of Samantha occurred. The interviews from that confession have never been made public. guys how's it going welcome to episode 30 this is the second and final part of the israel keys episode i will be really glad to stop thinking researching and talking about this piece of shit but <laughs> anyways let's just get through this i'm not gonna um give you a bunch of um small talk and um bantering um i'm just gonna get right to it um hopefully you guys are all happy that i'm going to be giving you this episode on friday rather than making you wait until sunday um i always hate like i mentioned i hate having to wait for second or third parters um, on the podcast that I like to listen to. So, um, yeah. So, I figured I don't want to do that to you guys if 
I can possibly help it. So it's a couple days later than I planned on getting it to you, but it's still early. So I still feel good about it. <laughs> Anyways, let's get on to the story. Israel admitted to the FBI that he had dismembered Samantha's body, wrapped the body parts inside trash bags, drove approximately 35 miles to Matanuska Lake, and dropped her remains through a hole he had cut in the ice. The water there is reportedly 40 feet deep. It took FBI's dive team 10 hours to recover Samantha's body. During one interrogation, Israel told the law enforcement, once I started, you know, there was nothing else like it. Now, when authorities initially caught Israel Keys, he was 34 years old at the time. He was a self-employed carpenter in Anchorage, Alaska. He was only suspected of just that one murder that of Samantha Koenig, the barista, near his home in Anchorage. But as he was interviewed, the FBI began to suspect that Israel Keyes was actually a serial killer. And because of the fact that he picked his victims at random, thousands of miles away from he lived, the Bureau's top criminal profiles, filers quickly designated his crimes as unprecedented. Days after confessing to the murder of 18-year-old Samantha Koenig, Israel, hoping to strike a deal with prosecutors, said that he would confess to a recent cold case that would not otherwise be solved, one that was clear across the country. He was looking for the entire prosecution to be over and done with within 12 months, and he wanted the death penalty. His most important stipulation was that he didn't want to hear his name in the press because he wanted to protect his daughter from his crimes. He told the FBI that if he found out about any media coverage that named him in any way, he would stop talking. Quote, I can tell you right now, there is no one who knows me or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. I'm two different people, basically, unquote. As an example of this duality, on the same day that Israel dismembered Samantha Koenig's body and sank it in the frigid waters of Matanuska Lake, he also attended a parent-teacher conference for his own daughter. As he spoke, the FBI's case agents and behavioral analysts came to a terrifying realization. They had never encountered anyone like Israel Keys before. One FBI agent who had spent a lot of time with Israel Keys said, quote, you can be in a room with him and it was like you were in the room with your neighbor. And then there were other times where, you know, the hair on the back of your neck stands up a little bit, unquote. In some ways, it looked like the FBI were in a way befriending a fucking serial killer, but it was just the act that they had to put on whenever they went into that room. They were just trying to kind of do anything that they could to get the information that they needed. Israel Keys voluntarily granted two dozen interviews to various investigators in the seven months after his arrest, even though he could have walked out at any given time. But he wanted to tell this story. He wanted to talk about what he did. He enjoyed the rush. He enjoyed the thrill of it. Their strategy paid off when Israel gave up the keys of two victims, a married couple more than 4,000 miles from Anchorage in Vermont. A Google Earth map of Burlington, Vermont was pulled up. As Israel had done with Samantha, he wanted to tell this story backwards, starting with the end. Watching and listening from another room, a couple FBI agents Googled missing couple Vermont and found a picture of Bill and Lorraine Courier. The photo had been taken outside underneath a tree. 
It looked like a picnic or some kind of family gathering. They were a middle-aged couple, both dressed casually, except for Lorraine's corsage and Bill's boutonniere. They were smiling and happy, and Bill's arm was around Lorraine. They sent that picture to the prosecutor. The prosecutor asked Israel, are those the two people you killed? Yup, Israel said. Had you ever met them before? Nope, Israel answered. Had you run into them before? Nope. Oh, he's so annoying. So on June 2nd of 2011, Israel flew from Anchorage, Alaska to Seattle, Washington, and then from Seattle, Washington to Chicago, Illinois. In Chicago, he rented a car and just began driving east. He was going to visit his brothers in Maine, but along the way, he stopped in Indiana for a couple of days and then at an old farmhouse he owned in upstate New York. After that, it was on to Burlington before reaching his final destination. As Israel approached this part of the story, he became physically exciting, bobbing his knees, jangling his shackles, rubbing against his armchair so hard that he scraped a layer of wood clean off of the arm of the chair. So anybody can go and look at a lot of these FBI interrogations and interviews. They are on um, YouTube. I watch them and they're fucking chilling. And like the way he tells the story, it's so creepy and scary. And um, I can't even like give any other explanation. So what pisses me off though, I think I said this on the first part, is that he fucking laughs. His laugh drives me up a fucking wall. Like he laughs about things that aren't even funny. Um, he's just a complete psychopath. So if you want to see those, I know that I um, you know, listed them in the case sources for part one. I'll do it again here. But you could literally just do a Google search for Israel Keys FBI interrogation and it's going to pop up all over the place. So um, I would highly su suggest watching them if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, I was. I watched a lot of it. And then there is another really good podcast called True Crime Bullshit. And the host of that podcast has done so much deep diving in his research, like to the point where I feel like he was totally obsessed with Israel Keys, and I get it. He's very... He's very interesting because he's so different. And I'm not saying that, you know, um, like I'm a fangirl or anything because I'm not. But like I mentioned in the first one, Israel Keys is the serial killer that does intrigue me the most. I'm most interested in him. And at the same time, I was like feeling so haunted and upset by hearing his voice, hearing him laugh about so many of the terrible things that he had done. And um, I might play you a couple more clips just so you can hear. But um, if nothing else, like listening to those FBI interrogations, they're just, they're fucking crazy guys. And, and the scariest thing is that there's probably people out there that are like him and possibly even people that are even worse than him that are out there and just haven't gotten caught yet. And that's the scariest thing is because Israel Keys did everything so randomly, like it could have literally been anyone. And what freaks me out is that, you know, he was in New Orleans and he could have easily been in Pensacola because New Orleans is only like maybe two and a half hours away. New Orleans and Pensacola is only like two and a half hours apart, I think. It's not very far. So it's crazy to think that, you know, he, anybody that's a serial killer can just, you know, pick somebody from random and not have, you know, a type of victim. But anyways, I went off on a little bit of a tangent. But anyways, um, let me continue 
As Israel told the FBI how it all went down, his signature expression of sexual excitement was impossible to miss. This was the way that investigators knew there was much truth to what he was saying. That night, Israel had waited until the sun went down before leaving his hotel on foot. He carried a backpack of supplies, some that were brought from home. He'd unearthed other supplies earlier that afternoon from a kill kit he'd buried in Vermont two years before. Several years back, Israel told them, he had taken a five-gallon Home Depot bucket and filled it full of zip ties, ammunition, guns and silencers, duct tape, as well as Drano to accelerate human decomposition, things like that, and he buried it there. He had more buried all over the country, but he would get into that detail later. Israel wandered around Burlington. His cell phone was off. His battery was out. A little after midnight, randomly, he found himself looking at the house on 8 Colbert Street. His years of experience in construction told him that this was a simple planned ranch home. He approached, crept around, found the phone line, and cut it. There was no alarm system. He got the sense that an older couple lived there, which was good because, you know, he had an idea, one that required a woman. There was an above ground pool and a barbecue in the backyard. There weren't any toys or floaties. There weren't any signs of children or any pets. Israel was dressed head to toe in black. Strapped to his skull was an unlit headlamp. He broke in through the attached garage, and after rifling through the green Saturn sedan parked inside the garage, he found himself in the kitchen. The whole thing took six seconds. He called it a blitz attack. At first, Bill, 50, and Lorraine, 55, didn't understand what was even happening. It took a few seconds for them to fully wake up and realize this wasn't a nightmare. A large masked man with a gun, a total fucking stranger, was really in their bedroom. Lorraine had been sleeping in a t-shirt and shorts, but Israel took lingerie from her dresser drawer. When asked by the FBI if he had made her change clothes, Israel responded, I don't know if I want to go into that. Israel ordered Bill and Lorraine to roll over on the bed, on their stomachs, and zip tied their wrists while barraging them with question, question after question after question. Do you have a safe? Do you have guns? Do you have any prescription drugs? Where's your jewelry? Where's your ATM cards? He demanded their PIN numbers and he scratched it into the card's surface and then he grabbed two suitcases and began stuffing them full of clothes and personal effects. After 15 minutes, Israel told them that they were all leaving the house together. He did interrupt his story to brag a little bit to the FBI. He told them that he never left physical evidence behind ever. It was a point of pride for him. He told them, I seriously doubt you're going to find DNA or fingerprints anywhere. Israel marched the couriers out to the garage, putting Lorraine into the front passenger seat. Her hands were still zip tied behind her back and he belted her in. He restrained Bill the same way in the back passenger seat, then slowly drove the Saturn out of the garage. They both begged. Bill needed his medicine. They had no money. If he just let them go, he could take the car and the little cash they had, everything, and they'd never tell a soul. Israel told them, oh, don't worry. This is just a kidnapping for ransom. I'm just bringing you to a drop off, a drop house. Other people will take it from there and you'll be fine. Inside Israel's backpack, was a pan, water bottles, 
50 feet of coiled nylon rope, duct tape, latex gloves, and one small propane stove. It was around 4 a.m., quiet and dark. The road and the sky horizonless when Israel pulled up to an abandoned farmhouse off of Route 15. That had been the reason for his drive earlier that day. He was looking for houses for just this moment. The house he'd settled on had a for sale sign staked in the brown grass. He had told the FBI that he always stopped at empty houses, especially if they had for sale signs up. Israel cut the lights and the ignition, leaving Lorraine tied in the front seat. He forced Bill through the basement's outdoor entrance and down the stairs, tying him to a stool within minutes. Impassively, Israel walked up and outside. There was Lorraine, out of the car, standing up. She saw him, and then she ran as fast as she could towards the main road, but unfortunately, Israel was much faster than she was. He tackled her and dragged her back to the house, pushing her up the stairs and into a bedroom. Israel strapped Lorraine's arms and legs to the bed with duct tape, and then he wrapped a, ro a rope around her neck and under the mattress, tying it off with a compound knot. Lorraine fought the entire time. Shouts started to come from the basement, echoing through the house. Where's my wife? Where's my wife? Israel checked his knots to make sure they were secure. He grabbed a knife, his forty caliber revolver, as well as his water bottle before heading down to the basement. Why the water bottle? The FBI had asked him this question, and all Israel said was, I'm not sure I want to get into that. I hate him. Bill was partway free at this point, and the stool was in pieces. The only light came from Israel's headlamp, and the sight of Bill thrashing around seemed as though he was under a strobe light. Israel said it pissed him off because there was a very specific way he wanted things done and he had the whole thing planned out. He had everything that he needed to do it. And then when he was asked what his plans for Bill was, all Israel said was, I'm not going to say what I was going to do to him. The FBI investigators didn't really need to hear it. They knew, they knew that Israel had planned to rape Bill as well. And so Israel said, when somebody messes up that plan, it kind of surprised even me that I lost control that way. He hit Bill with the shovel he'd found in the basement, but Bill didn't go down. It took at least one more hit to knock him to the floor. Israel ran upstairs after that. The propane stove he had set up had fallen through a hole in the bedroom floor and he panicked. The house was dry wood. It wouldn't take much for it to flame up fast. Incredibly, downstairs, Bill was back up on his feet. He's a badass motherfucker and yelling. He was yelling. So Israel ran back downstairs. He said he just started firing like a reflex, shooting Bill in the arms and the head and the neck and the chest. Bill Courier was still standing and Israel had never seen anything like that before. Then finally, with his last breath, Bill, the badass, fell to the floor. Israel went back upstairs to Lorraine. He then boiled water on the propane stove. And when the FBI asked him what that was for, Israel kind of chuckled and said, he said, I'm not sure I want to get into that today. Ugh, he's just fucking disgusting. Like, 
there's no other words besides disgusting. Well, there's lots of other words, but <laughs> you get what I'm talking about. I just, I'm like at a loss because it's just so crazy. But anyways, I'm going to play you this clip um, of Israel talking to the FBI about what happened next. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to go into details of that part. But, um, I, uh, I, like, I had all the ropes and had a bunch of stuff with me. Like, I, stuff that I had been thinking about for a while that I was going to do, and I did it. And, uh, uh, I had her tied up a couple of different ways. And she face down or take up? Uh, she was face down at first. And I'll face up at first. She came really close to getting away. Uh, <laughs> she was she was almost to the road when she when I found she got out of the car. I couldn't, couldn't believe that. I almost after that I almost wasn't going to use cable ties again because I didn't trust them. She was like. I think she was 50 something and she was a lot stronger than she looked. I don't think I've ever broke one of those cable ties. <laughs> but, um, yeah, after that, I think when I raped her the second time, I was worried about her screaming, so I had, uh, I made a gag, took a bunch of paper towels, and some duct tape, put them in her mouth, and uh, wrap duct tape around her mouth. And yeah, after after that, she was uh, she wasn't fighting anymore. I think she knew. I think she knew what was gonna happen. And uh, put all my. Uh, Anything that had touched her, like the cuffs and everything else, I, I didn't want to throw them away, but I just decided I better, so I threw all that stuff. I had one of those big bags, and I just, after I had, had her tied up, I had cut off all of her clothes with that knife. And, uh, actually, I think it was the same knife that I had on me when they arrested me in Texas. I put all her, you know, everything that had been on her, I put in that bag, and then uh, grabbed the bag, walked her down the stairs, to the, all the way to the basement, and uh, she was sitting on a bench down there. She was kind of out of it by then. She was, uh... When I, uh... The second time I raped her, I had, uh... I choked her. I think she passed out for a little while. And then, so she was... Yeah, like, by the time I walked her downstairs, she was a little bit out of it. I don't know if she really knew what was going on at that point. And, uh... I had my <laughs> had my leather gloves on and <sighs> I think I took a piece of the rope and stood behind her while she was sitting on that bench and used it like a carrot and strangled her. I knew that she was, I knew that she was gone. Oh my gosh, guys. <sighs> okay, so at that time, he was in such a rush. Israel had left all of his shell casings on the basement floor. 
um, all from the gun, you know, from shooting Bill. Um, he dragged Lorraine's body over to where Bill's body was laying, and he made sure that all of their restraints were cut off. And then he poured Drano over their hands and faces. He bagged each of their bodies inside two 55-gallon trash bags. And then he rolled their remains over to the basement southeast corner. After that, he piled a bunch of garbage and wood debris on top. I guess there was like a bunch of garbage bags and a bunch of like um, debris in the corner of the basement. So he piled that on top of the trash bags that had Bill and Lorraine in them. At this time, the sun was up. People were traveling Route 15 on their way to work in the morning. Israel had planned to, to burn the house with the bodies inside of it, but it was too late now. But he figured that really wasn't a problem. He was sure that whoever eventually bought this house would do it for the property and tear down the farmhouse or just torch it entirely. The smell from the basement would be so putrid, it would keep the most curious at bay. Plus, the likely assumption would be that a wild animal wandered in and died. So he really wasn't worried about anyone finding the courier's remains. Israel grabbed most of his stuff and drove the courier's car to a nearby Rite Aid parking lot. That's where he left his own rental car the night before. He left the courier's green Saturn as far away from surveillance cameras as he could and walked to his car with his head down and covered with a hoodie. Keys got into his car and left the state, heading up to Maine. Six hours from start to finish, and no one had suspected a thing. The FBI never found the courier's remains. The house had indeed been torn down. The bodies unwittingly excavated and dumped into the local landfill. The FBI made numerous attempts at the landfill. They searched for 10 to 12 weeks, but in the end, they were not able to recover Bill or Lorraine's bodies. It just breaks my heart. If Israel had not confessed, they would have never solved that crime, let alone have had any idea whatsoever what had happened to the couriers. After all, to neighbors and law enforcement, they had simply vanished one dark night. For the FBI, this horrifying story established Israel as a new kind of monster. One they would come to suspect was responsible for the greatest string of missing persons and unsolved murders in modern American history. While incarcerated, Israel spoke to investigators several times over a period of months. He cooperated to an extent, confessing to some of his crimes, but largely stopped cooperating after his identity was discussed in the media. On Wednesday, May 23rd of 2012, Keyes attempted to escape during a routine hearing, which was pretty fitting considering he felt that the serial killer he had most in common with was fucking Ted Bundy. <laughs> He used wood shavings from a pencil to pick at his cuffs. Police used a taser to subdue him, which must have been pretty hilarious to see. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for sure. While being held in jail at the Anchorage Correctional Complex on suspicion of murder, Israel managed to conceal a razor blade in his cell. He was not allowed razor blades since he was under security restrictions to only have use of an electric razor and only under supervision. Israel Keyes 
died by suicide on December 2nd, 2012 by cutting his wrists and strangling himself with bed sheets. A suicide note found under his body consisted of an ode to murder, quote unquote, but offered no clues about other possible victims, which pisses me off. It was actually a complete piece of shit to read. So I refuse to read it here on my podcast because fuck that guy. I don't want to give Israel or his final thoughts an avenue to get out in the universe any longer at this point. And if you're interested in reading it, it's on the internet 365 days of the year. And it sucks. He sucks. And like he took all those secrets with him about, you know, all the people that he had murdered. All these missing people. And he refused to help. In 2020 the FBI released a drawing that was done by Israel in his jail cell while he was in custody. It was a drawing of 11 skulls and one pentagram. It had been drawn in blood and found underneath Israel's bed after his suicide. One of the drawings included the phrase, we are one, written at the bottom. The FBI believes the number of skulls correlates with what are believed to be the total number of his victims. FBI believes that Israel killed four victims total in Washington state. About 60 miles southeast of Nia Bay, Washington, is another spectacular location, one that has the deepest lakes in the United States, and investigators suspect it is also a watery grave. Israel Keys had mentioned to them during one of the video interrogations, you guys know about Lake Crescent in Washington, right? Israel revealed to them that one of the bodies of a Washington state victim was sunk in this particular lake. Israel had told them that he thought the lake was five to 700 feet deep. Prior to his death, Israel had pointed the FBI to another victim in New York. He refused to provide that victim's name, but investigators believe it happened when Israel took a road trip through New York State in the spring of 2009. So they combed through missing persons reports as well as Israel's computer. And when they confronted him with photos there was one photo in particular that totally rattled him. They could tell. It was a photo of a woman named Deborah Feldman. And given the way he looked at it and began shaking a little bit, FBI is of the opinion that she is definitely one of his victims. Deborah Feldman is a woman who went missing from New Jersey in 2009. Her body has never been recovered. And although they are relatively confident about Deborah Feldman, the FBI do not have any forensic evidence to make that connection. According to the FBI, Deborah Feldman would have been Israel's fourth known victim, along with Samantha Koenig and Bill and Lorraine Courier. Agents are now determined to identify the remaining seven. And there are clues that point to at least two other states. The Green River in Wyoming is where Israel had buried another kill kit. The FBI has a strong suspicion that Israel Keys may have a victim located in that area. In the late 2000s, Israel also spent time in California's wine country including visiting the posh Sonoma town of Healdsburg in May of 2007. Israel often talked to investigators about using boats and also kayaks in the disposal of bodies. 
They know that he rented a single person kayak in Heldsburg near a campground during that time in the year 2007. But Israel's road trips were not limited to the United States. In 2007, he drove along the Elkin Highway by himself for about a week of that same year. And for those of you who are not aware, the Elkin Highway goes through Canada up to Alaska. We know that Israel traveled to Canada quite extensively and specifically said himself that he often went to Montreal. When he was asked about whether he'd killed anyone in Canada, his response was, Canadians don't count. If anyone has any information on Israel Keys and his travels, or if they have a family member that they think may have been potentially a victim of Israel Keys, they should come forward to the FBI with that information. That includes the Lake Crescent area of Washington State, where Israel told investigators he had dumped a body. They absolutely want people to come forward who think they may have seen something connected to Israel Keys, especially on Lake Crescent. And what about those kill kits Israel buried throughout the country? First, the FBI asked for people not to touch them and not to contaminate the kill kit and to definitely contact their local law enforcement in their community, who will then reach out to the FBI. The focus is clear to the FBI. The important thing to them is Samantha and Bill and Lorraine and Deborah and all the victims that don't yet have been, have not yet been identified. That's what the case is about. And their commitment to these victims is unwavering. To report tips about the Israel Keys case, call the FBI at 1-800-CALLFBI or submit them online at www.fbi.gov slash tips. And that's it, guys. I mean, there's so much more. There's so much more I could talk about. But, um, yeah, I'm crazy exhausted from this case, truly. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend. That would be great. Sharing is caring. (laughs) Um, Go ahead and rate it five stars if you'd like to. Um, Hit that follow button if you haven't already done so. That way, when the new episodes come out, they'll already be in your queue wherever you listen to podcasts. I appreciate you guys being here so much. Um, Thank you so much for, you know, continuing to listen and continuing to support me. I know I say it all the time and, you know, hopefully you guys, you know, understand how genuine I am when I tell you how much you're appreciated. Um... I'm going to go play with my puppy dogs. Oh, and let me tell you guys, I don't think that I mentioned it to you. I think I may have mentioned in a previous episode that there was a a black cat, a black kitty. She's really little, but she's got really long legs. Like she has big like spider legs, but she's a black cat with beautiful green eyes. Um, She kind of adopted me in the spring. And um, I was going to take her to get spayed and all that kind of good stuff. And she disappeared on me. And um, she has kittens. There's three kittens. <laughs> and um, they were living underneath the stairs, like in the hollowed out part of the cement stairs outside of this one door by our laundry room that we never use. But about a week ago, she brought them over to our front porch. It's a covered porch. And they all live there now. So I'm going to be finding homes for three little kittens. And they're so fun. They're so fun to watch. So I'm going to go outside and feed them and play with kittens and play with my puppy dogs and um, get some fur baby love. 
and um, tell Dahlia what a great mommy she is because she really is. And yes, I did name her Dahlia um, for the black Dahlia because she's black with beautiful green eyes. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know you're a true crime podcaster or a true crime fan when you name your cat after something or your pet after something to do with true crime, right? But anyways, um, after she weans her babies and I find them good homes, I'm definitely going to bring her out, bring her to the vet, get her spayed. And she found herself a forever home with me, that's for sure. So I've already got my two dogs and my other kitty, Jasmine. They are all rescue. So I am all rescue all the time. So go hug your fur babies. And um, I'll see you guys next time. And until then, you know what to do. Keep talking crime.